So, Moni Williams, my wife and I, and my daughter Pacey, um, have been up here since 19, well, my grandpa started here in 97. We've been here since 2004, uh, operating this land. Um, we run a cow-calf operation with a background operation and a yearling operation as well. When we first come up here, we were running 200 cows. Now we're running about 600 cow-calf pair and uh, running close to 400 yearlings in background up to about 700 calves in the wintertime. So things have drastically changed since 2004 when we first started. So we've had to make a lot of management decisions in order to justify running a lot more livestock, but with today's production costs, we, we, we got to push the numbers every time we can. Uh, some of the things we started doing uh, was starting to spray pastures, trying to control some undesirable weeds out there, um, including some years it has to control even uh, the sweet clover. Um, as bad as you'd like to leave it, but if you're not going to utilize the pasture till August or September, the sweet clover isn't doing you any good anyway. So if we go in there and spray some of them things off after some of the other things that we're wanting to clean up, uh, we also end up with a really good clean pasture by late fall to turn cows into. Um, we also found that our production just goes way up by getting rid of a lot of our weed pressure that we're able to push our numbers quite a little harder on some of these pastures. And when we first took over some of these pastures, they were pretty badly abused. And by cleaning up a weed pressure, really helped rejuvenate a lot of them, them poorer pastures. A lot of benefits by that. Um, rotational grazing, putting in water system, changing some fences uh, to help utilize everything. Um, we try to start in different pastures every spring to give all of our pastures a chance to have a rest. Uh, we also, after the Atlas blizzard, we had a really good wet fall and good spring. I actually give the pastures off the entire year off that we were in during the Atlas blizzard because they were they were so stomped out and so badly destroyed but we were just stuck out there and we couldn't move cattle I mean we just had to toughen it up and, and let the cattle kind of beat the ground up more than we'd ever like but it was amazing to see even by the next fall how good them pastures come back that you just didn't think that you could stomp one out that bad and and still have that kind of regrowth but fall moisture is always good that that's a big start to any of these grasses in the spring so on the crop ground um, all this ground was just in hay production when i first come up here and for several years i left it in hay production um, and then we aftermath graze a lot of these hay bottoms uh, but due to old stands lack, lack of alfalfa left in them we knew we needed to rejuvenate a lot of things in order to get the regrowth that we were wanting and a lot of the times we're giving up a second cutting or a seed crop if we don't have more alfalfa so uh, I've been a no-till guy for a long time anyway and so it was just easy to go in there spray things off start over uh, without ever working that ground and and to get a real good kill on the grasses that are out there and still raise a crop that same spring, uh, the only way you're really gonna do that is, is using no-till and chemicals. Um, then I've come back into it, usually I go in there with a sorghum sedan or a millet that very first year so that I can get things cleaned up and don't plant it till June, but I get two shots at controlling what I've got out there and cleaning it up. From there, we'll go back into it with probably winter wheat, or if it's too late, we'll use spring wheat and then follow it with winter wheat. And then I've been wanting to use cover crops for a while, but never had a place to put them until now. And so this is my first year at, at actually putting the cover crops in one for the compaction, the water infiltration, and then the fall grazing because it's just great to have somewhere to turn out some some weaned heifer calves in the fall and, and to, to stretch them along instead of pushing them in the feed yard all the time. That I think we can do our soils some justice and, and still get some good use out of the livestock across the land and instead of isolating it farm ground versus livestock. I, I think we gotta be able to use 
that same ground for both all the time. You know, the other thing I've done is I've changed my calving dates. Um, we still calve the heifers in February because we can get the heifers bred in late May, first by the 1st of June, and get them out to grass. So we're dragging them along in the feedlot a little later into the spring than you want, but then you can go straight to grass with them. So you're forced into calving in February with the AI cycle. But I took all the cows and I moved them back into April instead of starting them in March. Um, the weather, the mud, the, the soils I'm in are such a heavy clay here and the mud just wrecked me and it was actually better in the cold but I'm getting older and, and that just isn't as much fun as it used to be uh, to get up and spotlight cows all night and, and it just really wasn't working. We are having too much death loss, too much sick. Uh, calves so we've changed all that to April about the April 10th we start calving the cows everything I try to calve out on the in the pastures now uh, took the labor out of it to where we just ride on the cows every other day and uh, I'm also finding we can run more cows through the summer because we got a lighter calf by our side not eating as much and so we can actually push our numbers a little higher again um, so I'm also weaning that calf then, still in the first week of October. So I'm weaning the lighter, younger calf earlier and putting him on feed. Uh, but at the same time, when I manage to do that, it gives them cows more time to fleshen up going into winter. And so then I actually winter graze all the cows. Uh, most of these cows here uh, won't see any hay year round that we are strictly a range graze deal unless the snow gets too deep but you know until we see 10 inches of snow I can continue to graze cows with just a supplement program. What do you think of the benefits of being a winter grazer? Uh, they're just huge if I don't have to put the, the time and money and labor into feeding them cows like I said uh, I don't know a lot of people like to go out and cake them cows and I think more than anything is they can get a count and make sure they're all there well I've got them out in the breaks and I really don't need to see them cows every day and I've got them on a free choice supplement so as they come into water they can get the protein and the energy they need out of the free choice supplement and I just have to make sure water is always open and available um, to, to let them cows get by. Like say weather gets really bad well then I'll have to start to put some feed into them but I think last year I had 500 cows that we never fed 100 bales to all winter. So I haven't had to spend the money on the feed and I'm able to sell a little more hay in the process. And I quit back or quit uh, creep feeding the calves. Since I'm backgrounding all the calves now, I'm getting a better gain on them calves by actually backgrounding them myself instead of using the creep feed in the summertime. And again, it's labor. I mean, trying to find time to run out and fill creep feeders every week versus, well, let's just wean them, ultrasound the cows. At the same time, another less, you know, one less trip through the corrals with the cows. I mean, everything is about labor around here because it's just my wife and I and maybe one other hired employee and to run this many cattle, we, we just can't do it without more people. And you know, most of the time there isn't any more money available to hire more help uh, if you can find the help in the first place. Exactly, and like I said, a free choice distillers and salt is what I've been doing and putting them actually into my creep feeders and put them available. But like I say, I, my water is open 24 hours a day. That way, as the cows come into water, it's available instead of going and calling all the cows in to feed all at one time. Yeah. Now, you might get a better job of every cow eating the same amount if you were putting them out there, I mean, calling them in, but on the free choice, I guess it kind of comes down to how much salt she can consume and how much energy she wants to consume at the same time because not everybody consumes the same amount of salt. My wife don't use much salt and I use it on everything. I can't imagine the cows are any different. Yeah. So you do have to watch that a little bit. You'll have some cows that'll get a little thin on you more than you want. But again, when we don't calve into April or May, I'm not that concerned about it. I mean, there's going to be a little bit of a lack of colostrum on this situation because that cow got a little bit thinner than you want, but that cow has a lot of time to recuperate. We just got done 
spring testing cows and we were less than 4% open on 600 cows and amazing how we were like 74% bred in the first 21 days of, of April for next year. Yeah. Um, even the cows that calved in, in May and June have caught up for this year. Uh, but it rained, lots of green grass, cows are fleshy, lots of time to recuperate, they bred up really well. You know, when we used to try and get under 10% breed up before and we were calving in March and April, it was tough. It, you put a lot of feed into cows. And like I said, I just don't put much feed into cows anymore. The cow kind of has to pay for herself around here anymore. Uh, generally here in, in western South Dakota where I'm at, we're a very typical 16 to 18 inches annual moisture. It's a very dry land country, so we really got to take advantage of a lot of our spring moisture. We got to conserve that moisture and um, you know, leaving some old grass out in the pastures, having some shade, some canopy, something to help catch some snow, um, have all been really beneficial to everything I've been doing. And um, you can even see it out where I feed that if it's muddy, I'm feeding in the feed bunks. If I do have any cows in here on feed, because um, typically, like my first calf heifers, then they stay here and, and on feed until we go to grass. But when it's dry, I just keep changing where I feed every day and spread out all of your nutrients. And it's amazing to see you can follow the feed wagon as to where you fed the next summer. And you can see how much better the grass is just by doing that. As long as you don't over stomp it, you know, you're still gonna have your problems around your water source that you can't get away from. But if you can get out and, and move that feeding location every single day, that your pastures will just rebound like you can't believe that you've really overused all winter long. When we destroy it, I try to put it into about a four or five year crop rotation. And primarily the first year and the last year are gonna be forage production again. So hay mill it and then try to do a couple cash crops in there of winter wheat, spring wheat, um, possibly some safflower as a cover crop back into alfalfa again to try to winter graze any of them that I can um, and if I can go back in and plant some cover crops anytime we can grow that kind of forage just to graze is just a remarkable return on my investment. Um, the thing I've learned from even uh, Dr. Beck uh, was the, the best cover crops are cleaning out your seed closet. So I did buy the turnips and radishes but I also use the leftover BMR and the leftover millet seeds, and I'm letting a lot of volunteer wheat come back. I went out and sprayed the, the wheat ground after shortly after harvest, cleaned up the weeds, and then the volunteer flush come in there, and I'm letting it go. Uh, as long as you can control the weeds out there, you, the winter wheat will be great grazing. It does use a little more moisture than I'd like as a cover crop, but in the long term, as long as we get some snow and, it, and we have some canopy, I don't think it's gonna hurt me. And looking at the soils so far from what I see, it, it looks like it's been a really good, really good choice. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to get some calves out here and graze them this fall to see how they do on it. And then to turn around and destroy it to, uh, in the spring to plant it back to, um, more than likely some of this will be back into BMR for silage for next year with uh, as a cover for alfalfa. Um, out here I do a lot of things different uh, and surprisingly I planted the the cover crops an inch and a half to two inches deep which everybody tells me not to do and I do it uh, because I have to put that seed into moisture in order to get it to germinate it. When I planted it the first week of September, it was really dry, but I was planting it into moisture and I got all them cover crops to come up there. The radishes and turnips really come up fast. I was impressed how quick it does. Uh, but I also plant alfalfa that deep too, uh, for the same reason, is I gotta get the seed to germinate and I've never had a failure as long as I've been using a no-till drill and planting alfalfa seed deep. Uh, in turn, I also see longer stands of alfalfa because we set the crown lower on the alfalfa plant into the soil, um, so I don't have as much winter kill. And I also have fields stay way smoother uh, for years to come 
so when I'm out there haying it, I'm not beating my equipment up. Uh, I've changed to a disc bind mower conditioner, and so I'm able to run at faster speeds, so I gotta have the ground smooth enough to do it. So I've had to make a lot of adjustments as the equipment changes and the soils change and, and what we're doing with the soils, but uh, I mean, I don't see why we can't raise three ton alfalfa dry land year in, year out with a little bit of spring moisture. And um, the other adjustments I'm starting to make now is we just ordered some pivots to start putting in off of some other water sources that we have available. Um, and I'm kind of looking forward to what we can do there with the cover crops and the no-till under, under pivot irrigation out here and on some of my better ground. So things continue to change every day for me too, that we got a lot to learn about the soils and what we can do with it.